Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Autism Spectrum Disorder Primer for Case Managers. This is Erica Hurdle. I am Program Coordinator for the Iowa Regional Autism Assistance Program. I am happy to introduce to you today Kelly Pelzell and Todd Kopelman, who will be our speakers. Kelly Pelzell, PhD. Kelly Pelzell is a licensed psychologist and a clinical assistant professor working in UIHC's Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Division. She received her BA from UNI and her PhD from the University of Utah. Dr. Pelzell provides assessment and treatment services for children and adolescents. She also is involved with intervention research. Additionally, Dr. Pelzell is a psychology technical consultant for the Regional Autism Assistance Program and clinical coordinator for the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital Autism Center. Dr. Pelzell is interested in evidence-based therapies for young children with and without autism. And Todd Kopelman, PhD, BCBA. Todd Kopelman, Dr. Kopelman is a licensed psychologist and certified behavior analyst. He is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, where he serves as the co-director of the UIHC Autism Center. Dr. Kopelman conducts autism evaluations with children and adults, and he also does clinical work and research in the area of severe and challenging behaviors. He has been a board member of the Autism Society of Iowa since 2010. And now just for one housekeeping note, um, you can see under handouts, there's a certificate of attendance available for you that you're able to um, print off and keep for your records. Um, and now we'll welcome Kelly and Todd. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Erica, for that wonderful introduction. And Kelly, it's always great to have the opportunity to present. Uh, just uh, a little housekeeping on our end of things. Um, only one of us can control the slides and that's gonna be Kelly. So if you hear me saying next uh, on occasion, that's, that's why. Uh, so we're gonna just start off with a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, this is a primer on autism. So we're gonna start off by talking about autism and hopefully give you a sense of, of what autism is, um, how it can look, um, and what the diagnostic criteria are that psychologists and other medical providers use when they're evaluating somebody. Um, next, we're gonna talk about um, difficulties in what are re what's referred to as adaptive functioning, which I know as a case manager is a really important area um, to look at when determining services. Uh, we're gonna talk about evidence-based interventions, what the research suggests can be effective for individuals with autism to address different types of concerns. And then we're gonna um, dive in just a little bit to talk about challenging behaviors um, in autism and options for crisis management services. And I just wanna say, as, as I'm sure you are aware, this is a broad overview. Each of these separate topics could certainly be a talk in and of itself. So we hope to give you some good information today but we're not gonna be exhaustive as far as um, going into a lot of depth. Okay, so next slide here. So this is a little thought exercise. I know everybody is on listen only mode, but I would like you to just do a word association game. So when you hear the term autism or autism spectrum disorder, I'm curious what comes to mind for you. Um, is it certain features or characteristics? Is it somebody from a movie or TV show? Is it a family member or a loved one? And I'm gonna show you here some pictures that, that have come to mind for me. Um, autism certainly has been well represented in the media. I would say sometimes pretty well, sometimes not so well, um, but it's becoming increasingly common to see um, characters in different shows and movies. This is going way back. I don't know anybody who's watching. Bonus to you if you're aware of this movie because it's, gosh, it's gotta be over 20 years. Um, this is a movie that I really liked uh, called What's Eating Gilbert Grape uh, with a younger uh, Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's based on a fantastic book that's actually set here in Iowa. It's fictional. Um, but the character named Arnie played by Leo um, I would strongly suspect has autism and probably co-occurring intellectual disability. And he plays a very big role in the movie. Um, so moving on, this is probably a character, Sheldon from The Big Bang, that's more familiar to most people. Um, and a lot of people, when they think about the diagnosis that we used to have called Asperger's syndrome, 
might think about a character like this. Um, there are, I've just noticed, a lot of detectives who now have autism as well. Um, and this is, um, again, bonus to anybody who is aware of this. Uh, but this is um, a, a TV show, a foreign TV show, where the detective um, named, I'm probably going to mispronounce her name even though I've watched it. The show is called The Bridge. Her name is Saga Norin. Um, certainly has autism and um, based on many of the characteristics and I really like the show and I like the fact that they um, provided a nice characterization, characterization of a female on the autism spectrum since we tend to see more males. Lots of books that have prominently featured um, individuals with autism, both fictional as well as non-fictional. Um, Kelly and I actually co-teach a graduate class on autism and one of the fun uh, assignments, at least fun to us, and I think the students like it too, is every semester we ask each of them to choose a book, a fun book where autism plays a large role. And so we've been exposed to a lot of different books over the years we've taught the class. Um, a very well-known book, fictional, is The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which later on became a very successful play. Uh, more recently, The Rosie Project also has become pretty popular. Um, and, and I really enjoy both of those books. Uh, one other book, and I'm just throwing this in here, it's a great book um, by a neurologist named Oliver Sacks called An Anthropologist on Mars. And I, I put this one in because I was thinking about this when I was getting ready for this talk today. This is probably the first time I was introduced um, to somebody with autism. So the book has several chapters and in one of the very last chapters in the book, Oliver Sacks interviews a woman who he calls a self-reflective autistic woman. And again, this was written, I'm sure, 25 or so years ago, maybe more. Uh, next slide. And the woman that he interviewed um, is, maybe some of you might um, be aware of, of her based on the picture or when I say her name was Temple Grandin. Um, who has become very well known, I think, within and outside of the broader autism community um, for, for the excellent work and advocacy and support that she has done. Um, so I first experienced her based on, on that book, and it's a wonderful read. So another real life person um, who identifies as having autism, um, more, recent is, more recently is, is this man on a rock uh, <laughs> named Alex Honnold. Um, and if any of you um, are interested during this COVID period and looking for cool things to watch, I do strongly recommend it's a documentary. Um, I think it won the Oscar a few years ago for best documentary. It's called Free Solo. And it's about Alex, who Free Solo climbs um, a variety of just crazy impressive rocks, um, including this one here in, in Yosemite. And he um, identifies himself as being on the autism spectrum and really credits having autism to a lot of strengths he has with respect to his um, strong focus on climbing and his ability to concentrate on that interest. So you may have had other characters or features come in mind, but those are the things that, that sometimes have come to mind for me. So with that background in mind, what is autism? Um, it is hard to explain concisely what autism is. It is a spectrum, we know that, it's part of the name now. Probably the best definition I've come across is this one. It is a developmental or neurodevelopmental, meaning brain-based disorder that is characterized to differing degrees by difficulties in two main areas. So the first area is what we call difficulties or deficits in social communication. So we often talk about, again, that word deficit or delays in this broad area of, of social communication. And we'll go into more detail on that soon. The second area that also is required for an autism diagnosis is the presence of what are called restricted and repetitive patterns of interest and behavior. So autism is of delay or deficit combined with these areas of excesses in behavior, which I think makes it fascinating. All right, next slide. Just a sec, Todd. No problem. Okay. So 
we sometimes talk, because um, Kelly and I both work at the hospital in Iowa City, we talk to residents and medical students, and they're often very busy. And so they just tell us they want the most basic information and what, what we think is important information. So over the years, I've developed this cheat sheet and then updated it over time. So here's some basic information about autism. Um, autism, the prevalence rate or how commonly autism occurs has increased quite a bit over the last few decades. So right now it's just over one in 50 school-aged children in the United States are suspected of having an autism spectrum disorder based on some research that's done every few years out of the Centers for Disease Control. We don't have a formal registry. We don't keep track of the numbers of, of individuals with autism in Iowa specifically, but based on that one in 54, we would strongly suspect that means um, that would translate into over 10,000 children. So it's a fair, fair number for sure. One thing that has stayed steady is the male to female ratio. There are more males diagnosed with autism than females. It's about four to one. Um, in general, we think about the core features or symptoms of autism occurring very early in life. Oftentimes, autism can be accurately diagnosed by around the age of two. Um, but I do work with adults, too, who are suspected of having autism. And so I don't want to say that if somebody, I don't want to say it's impossible by any means for somebody to slip through the cracks um, and not be diagnosed until later in life. So oftentimes, especially if there are more impairing symptoms, we're going to catch it very early, but sometimes it's, it occurs later um, that we make the diagnosis. Uh, we think of autism as a stable disorder, meaning it doesn't go away. It's not something like the flu. Um, right now, there's not a cure for autism, so stay away from any Google sites you see that promise that. Um, but the good news is there are some nice evidence-based interventions, and Kelly will be talking about those soon. Um, this could be a lecture in and of itself, what causes autism. We do largely think about genetic factors, in other words, that it's, it's a heritable disorder, but there is not an autism gene. There's not a single cause, and we do believe that there are gene environment interactions, so it's fairly complex. And that's a very active area of research. We'll talk a little bit about this later, but um, it's important to keep in mind as case managers that comorbid psychiatric or mental health diagnoses are very common with autism. So oftentimes it's not just an individual with autism, but an individual with autism and other areas of psychiatric uh, difficulty or concern. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, autism is costly. Um, from a financial standpoint. Um, latest information I saw from uh, just a few years ago is, and this is an estimate of course, but in the United States we spend around $236 billion a year um, across the lifespan for education and treatment. And depending on an individual's needs, that would break down to a lifetime cost per person of between $1.4 and $2.4 million with individuals who have more impairing symptoms tending to require more services, and so it makes sense they would be closer to that 2.4 mark. Um, nationwide, but definitely in Iowa as well, there is a pretty severe shortage, unfortunately, of programs for individuals with autism and of providers um, to deliver different types of care that is needed. So again, thinking about your role as a case manager, that's gonna be a challenge that you may experience is knowing what to do, but then linking that, that patient or that family with the help that, that would really be beneficial. And then a final point is that autism is what we call a very heterogeneous diagnosis. And hopefully the different characterizations and pictures that I showed earlier gives you a taste of that, but there's no one type of autism. There are autisms within that broad spectrum umbrella. And that does have a lot of implications for how we can best support and help individuals with ASD. A lot of different services that might be helpful for one person, but not as much of a need for others. And this is just a representation of the different ways that autism can present itself. And I borrowed this uh, from a colleague at the University of Minnesota from several years ago. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but just looking at, you know, point by point, if we think about cognitive functioning or what's sometimes referred to as IQ or intelligence, it can range anywhere from intellectual disability around 40 to 50 percent 
of persons with autism also have an intellectual disability, most on the mild end of intellectual disability, but on the other end of the spectrum, no pun intended, are individuals who are what we call twice exceptional or gifted, meaning that their cognitive abilities are advanced and they still have autism. So it really is that whole gamut. Social interaction, this is a very old term from um, a well-known um, researcher in the area of autism, Lorna Wing, but she talks about these different categories of social difficulties. Somebody with autism may be aloof, meaning very disinterested in engaging socially, at least they appear that way. Or on the other end, they may be what she referred to, and again, this is 40 years or so ago, but is still used as active but odd socially, meaning that they are interested and they will approach other people, but sometimes they just struggle with um, some of the, the more social aspects of communication. So knowing when to start a conversation, when to pick up on other people's cues that maybe they're not interested in hearing about that person's topic of interest any longer. Communication, some persons with autism, and this is a minority, maybe 20% or so, are considered nonverbal or to have very limited um, verbal communication across their lifespan. But that means that most people who are diagnosed with autism do develop verbal skills, and some are even what we call hyperverbal, meaning that they are talking and reading and using other forms of, of communication at a very early age. Um, behaviors, we'll talk about this later again, but um, it is not uncommon for individuals on the autism spectrum to engage in what we call severe challenging behaviors. Um, depending on the research, um, upwards of 50% or more of individuals with autism do exhibit those behaviors at some point in their life. But that means a fair number do not, um, that they have no behaviors of significant concern. And then finally, sensory issues can range anywhere from hyposensitive, meaning an underreaction, maybe to temperature or touch or pain stimuli, to being very acutely sensitive, and it causes a lot of distress to hear certain noises or certain tastes, touch, any type of sensory um, modality. So how is autism diagnosed? Um, clinicians tend to use, in the United States anyway, this big book, you're probably familiar with it, called the DSM-5. That's the most recent version. Came out, oh, five or six years ago. And for autism, there were quite a few changes made in the DSM-5. Um, compared to the DSM-4, so autism really was revised quite a bit. So I do want to spend just a few minutes talking about what the diagnostic criteria are. And I had mentioned a little bit earlier in this talk that there are two main categories, so those are the ones I'm going to go through. The first category is A, and as you can see, um, persistent deficits in what are referred to as social communication and social interaction that occur across multiple contexts. So think about home, typically for children's school, and then maybe out in the community. And then there are three social communication symptoms. All of them have to be met to consider the diagnosis. The first one here in bold is referred to as difficulties in social and emotional reciprocity, just meaning difficulty having back and forth social and emotional connections or engagements with others. And then in the DSM, they list a whole range of examples of what that might look like, keeping in mind they're not expecting any one person to meet all of these symptoms. And these go more or less from, from more mild in present presentation to more severe. So it can range anywhere from just an unusual social approach to a failure to have normal back and forth conversations, not sharing interests or emotions as much, to a total failure or lack of initiating or responding when other people approach that individual. So that's one of the hallmark criteria that we're looking at is social and emotional reciprocity impairments. The second area is what's referred to as difficulties in nonverbal forms of communication that are used for social purposes. And again, the, in the DSM, there are just examples listed to consider. So that can range anywhere from a child or an adult who has a hard time integrating or pulling together verbal and nonverbal communication. So they may have a hard time, for example, talking and gesturing or how they posture their body, that those things just don't come together naturally. 
There may be abnormalities in the use of eye contact and body long language, um, or again, lack of gestures. And then on the extreme, you may see almost no facial expressions or no forms of nonverbal communication. And just as a little bit of a side note, when we're evaluating, especially children in our clinics, sometimes what we're trying to figure out with a younger child is, does he or she have a, a significant language disorder or could it be autism as well? And this criteria, looking at the nonverbal forms of communication can be really helpful because if a child just has a language disorder, oftentimes we don't see those same difficulties with the use of gestures and eye contact. In other words, they're trying to use other ways to get their point across, whereas a child with autism may not rely on those nonverbals either. And then finally, a general category is just having a really hard time making and keeping friendships and other types of, of relationships. And again, a range here, not being able to adjust your behavior to suit various social contexts. So children, I would say fairly early on, learn about indoor and outdoor voices or how to talk to parents versus friends versus teachers. Uh, a child with autism may struggle with those social differences. Difficulty sharing an imaginative play and, and making and keeping friends, as I mentioned, to on the far end of the spectrum, a total apparent interest in, in peers. So those were the social hallmarks of autism that we look at. The second category is looking at behaviors. And so that's where B comes in, restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. And there are four kind of categories or symptoms in this area. You only have to meet two of the four um, to consider autism. The first category, are, as you can see, is repetitive behaviors. And those can be repetitive motor movements, sometimes referred to as seriotopies, or more commonly, somebody might say, my child flaps their hand or bounces up and down or has other repetitive motor movements. It can be repetitive speech. Either the child says the same thing over and over and over again in sort of an unusual way, or the child asks or even insists that other people say things in a very specific way or else they get upset. Um, or it could be what we refer to as repetitive use of objects. And I've got a picture next of that. So this is from an old video that I still really like on YouTube of a child named Quinn um, who was diagnosed with autism. And Quinn is asleep here, he's a toddler. And you can see this is just one of the signs of repetitively lining up objects. Um, and he would do that apparently with all sorts of objects. So the next category under the behavior is what we call rigidity. Wanting to do things, insisting I should say, on doing things exactly the same, even if most people would think it really doesn't have to or even should be done that way. So getting very upset with very small changes. So for example, if the silverware is slightly moved, there's a different color cup, those types of small changes that most children might get a little bit, they might notice it, but they're not gonna have full-blown tangents. Difficulties with transitions between activities, we hear that a lot from families. Um, and then in older children, very rigid thinking patterns. Um, just things have to be the same. And so I have just kind of a general picture of that next. And this is just pulled from the internet, but I do hear from parents not uncommonly that they struggle when they have to make changes in their daily routine. Um, I'll never forget, I had a parent tell me that there was construction between their house and school, and so they had to take a different route to school. They had no other choice, but their child started to engage in severe self-injurious behavior, banging their head against the seat in front of them um, just because of that change. And the mom, understandably, was like, I don't know what to do, I can't change the construction. Um, the third symptom is um, what we call unusual or unusually intense interests. And you can see here strong attachments to unusual objects or the technical term is excessively circumscribed or perseverative interests. So this usually falls into one of two domains. It's a child who likes things that other children at their developmental level might like like trains or dinosaurs, but this child has an encyclopedic knowledge of that topic, wants to talk about it and play and explore it 24 seven. 
And you usually know this when this happens because parents will say they are exhausted, that they have every Thomas toy, their child has memorized them all, and they wanna do something else with their kid other than playing Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, next slide, yeah, this one. And another kind of variation of that are children who might have interests that are pretty intense that we wouldn't expect to see for their developmental level. So it could be, and, and these are all examples that I've experienced, a child who spends a lot of time opening and closing doors, turning on and off light switches, who knows everything about vacuum cleaners. I had a child in clinic, didn't even say hi when they met me, but they just asked me right away what kind, what model of vacuum cleaner I had um, and all sorts of technical information about it. I've had um, children come into clinic with electrical cords um, and their parents tell me that they sleep with those cords and they're three or four years old. So strong interest that just from a developmental um, lens, we would not necessarily expect to see. And then the final category under that behavioral domain is sensory sensitivities. And again, that can be hyper or hypo reactivity. So you can read here apparent indifference to pain, to sounds, um, visual fascination with lights or movements. Again, a very common symptom that parents might report. And just an example, um, a child might be wearing something like headphones because certain noises are, are very abrasive to them, cause a lot of difficulties. So in addition to those symptoms, what as clinicians we need to consider is the child's developmental or the person's developmental um, kind of life experience. We expect the symptoms usually to emerge early in life, but, and this is in the DSM, they may not become fully manifest. We may not see all of the symptoms until social demands exceed that person's capacities, or they may be masked by learning strategies in later life. Sometimes a term that I hear is social camouflaging. Um, and a lot of adults will tell me that they have learned to hide parts of themselves, to tone things down because of the negative responses that they've gotten socially, but that it causes them a lot of distress to not be able to kind of be who they are as a human. So we look for that symptom. Symptoms have to cause clinically significant impairments in um, more than one area of life. That's really important. I think all of us are entitled to have idiosyncrasies in life and to be different. And that can be a challenge diagnostically, but with autism, it's not only a difference, but it's causing significant impairment in one or more areas of life. And then finally, the symptoms can't better be accounted for, explained by other diagnoses like intellectual disability or what is called a general developmental delay in a younger child. And then we look at these specifiers. So when we're making the diagnosis, does the child have an intellectual disability, a language impairment? Are there medical or genetic conditions that can co-occur with autism? Is it associated with other developmental or behavioral um, areas of concern? So I had mentioned these comorbidities or co-occurring um, diagnoses. This is really important to keep in mind that most, up to 70% of persons with autism, do have at least one other comorbid psychiatric diagnosis, and 40% have two or more. The most common that I see um, are ADHD or executive functioning difficulties and anxiety-based disorders, but there certainly can be others as well. Um, intellectual disability, I touched on that, commonly co-occurs. And then medical issues like seizure disorders can commonly occur with autism as well. So it's really important to look at the individual holistically and not just focus on this diagnosis of autism. Um, and then finally, you can see that very commonly, sleep concerns, toileting concerns, difficulties with feeding or eating, motor difficulties, and behavior concerns co-occur. Okay, thank you, Todd. I'm gonna switch yeah. gears now and talk about adaptive functioning. And adaptive functioning, um, by definition, is uh, a collection of conceptual, social, and practical skills that are learned and performed by people in their everyday lives. And um, we think uh, uh, this is pretty important for, to think about with, with any um, patient or client that we have, um, but especially um, with autism spectrum disorder, um, because there can be quite a lot of variation, quite a bit of um, individual differences in these skills. 
And um, we know that you as case managers think about that a lot as well. Um, just another little definition here um, by Jerome Sattler, the degree to which the individuals, in, an individual is able to function and maintain themselves independently and the degree to which they meet satisfactorily the culturally imposed demands of personal and social responsibility in their environment. So it's very much um, housed within um, the environment that the individual um, lives and works. Okay. Some examples of adaptive behavior on the conceptual skills category, things like language and literacy skills, um, being able to um, handle, count back money, those sorts of things, uh, read, uh, read the time um, and understand um, time concepts, number concepts, and also have um, self-direction or the ability to kind of initiate um, activities. Social skills, or things like interpersonal skills, social responsibility, self-esteem, um, how um, gullible or naive someone might be, um, wariness about um, certain social situations that they um, should be wary of, uh, social problem solving and the ability to follow rules, obey laws and to avoid being victimized. Um, this is typically an area that um, is more difficult for individuals um, with autism spectrum disorder. Um, given that um, social deficits are a, uh, a part of the, uh, the diagnosis. And then practical skills. So those activities of everyday living. Um, so personal self-care skills, occupational skills on the job, healthcare, um, being able to navigate that system, uh, be able to think about travel and transportation needs, uh, maintain schedules and routines, um, safety skills, using money appropriately and um, using the telephone or other ways to communicate. So as um, psychologists, um, Dr. Copeland and I um, assess adaptive functioning um, pretty often as part of our diagnostic workup. And there's a number of reasons we, we do that. Um, probably like number one across all psychologists is if we are looking um, to see if an individual has an intellectual disability. Um, and uh, because adaptive deficits are, are part of that um, diagnostic, part of the diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. So, so we need to measure it um, in cases where we suspect that the individual may have um, significant cognitive deficits and adaptive deficits. Um, but sometimes we look at it even when we're not concerned about intellectual disability. So if we're trying to identify a person's strengths and weaknesses, um, either compared to other people, um, so that's called relative strengths and weaknesses, uh, or sorry, normative strengths and weaknesses, or if we're just trying to get a sense within that individual, which things are easier and harder for them, we might look at what's called relative strengths and weaknesses. Um, if an individual's been in an intervention or um, uh, we want to see how they're working out in an environment over time, we might use a measure of adaptive functioning to measure that progress or to measure the results of the intervention. And then if we want to compare what's going on across environments, so how capable um, a person is in one environment versus another to try to um, get a sense of how, how much we might need to change up one of those environments or, or think about that in the future, um, we can also assess adaptive behavior for the for that reason. So many individuals with autism have adaptive functioning deficits, even if they do not have intellectual disability. Um, and the reasons that we think about this occurring are um, one, there's a lot of um, deficits in the area of social communication. So um, that really interferes with a lot of the social engagement skills um, that would then later kind of morph into some of those other social skills I talked about. But also it really interferes with imitation skills and the development of learning how to do things through imitation um, early on, um, which then can cause um, delays in other areas like um, self-care or domestic skills, um, things that they would see and pick up um, around in their environment. <clears throat> Those repetitive and restrictive behaviors that, that Todd just talked about can interfere with getting things done 
um, efficiently. Um, having uneven cognitive abilities is also pretty common with autism spectrum disorders. Um, there's um, sometimes kids are, are very even between their verbal or language based skills and their nonverbal or like visual spatial skills. Other times, um, one of those is um, significantly higher um, than the other. And uh, I think especially when um, uh, children or individual adults with, uh, with autism have strong language skills, um, but weak visual spatial skills, um, that can really um, cause some difficulties in terms of adaptive functioning. And oftentimes it's, um, it's hard for people around them to understand um, because as a, as a culture, we tend to kind of judge cognitive skills based on people's language skills um, in the United States. And so um, sometimes that seems like a bit of a mystery um, to us if someone um, can express themselves relatively well with their language, um, but are still really struggling um, with uh, a lot of tasks that require organization and understanding of how things fit or go together. Um, and then those comorbid uh, conditions, um, like if a, an individual has ADHD, they may have um, poor concentration skills. And since the comorbidities um, tend to run high with autism spectrum disorder, um, this population as a whole um, can have more adaptive deficits. And I already talked about that last point that those relatively strong cognitive skills, especially in um, the verbal area can mask those adaptive deficits. So that's something to really um, look out you know, look out for as you're thinking about an individual's needs and, and their programming needs. Okay, now we'll step into talking about evidence-based interventions. So um, what interventions we want or we choose for an individual um, typically relate to um, what kind of goals um, we have for them. So, you know, we can be thinking about it being pretty individualized depending on the person's needs. So maybe we're looking to improve their communication skills or their social functioning or their play skills. Maybe we're targeting that adaptive function I was just talking about. Or we're thinking about school-based stuff. We wanna look at their academic skills. They're having a lot of challenging behavior, so we, you know, would need to um, we would need to uh, how to treat that, and that we can address um, those comorbid medical and psychiatric conditions that come up um, through um, through like uh, medication management or getting set up with the correct medical providers um, to deal with sleep or GI or other, um, other issues. Um, and that we're looking sometimes with our, our interventions to promote independence and quality of life for the individual. The other thing we think about as we're thinking about interventions is what we're doing currently and then how that fits in with the bigger picture of where we're going with, with the person. So we really want those short-term treatment goals to provide some scaffolding toward the long-term outcomes we're, we're envisioning for the individual. Okay, and when we think about interventions, we, we think about things that have um, good research behind them um, because there are a lot of interventions out there for individuals with autism, an overwhelming number really. Um, and um, a lot of them have very little research showing that they work. And everyone's time and money is limited. Um, so we, when we recommend something, we want to recommend something that we think are think is most likely to achieve the goals and the desired outcomes of the individual and their family. Okay, I'm gonna say a little bit about early intervention here, some basic principles, and then I'm gonna um, present kind of across. Um, age ranges, um, things that we know um, are effective based on research. So with early intervention, um, we want to start um, programming as early as possible. So um, sometimes we make pretty early diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder, um, two years, sometimes even earlier. So, um, we've um, diagnosed toddlers before at 18 months if the symptoms are, are super clear cut at that age. Um, and that's pretty young, um, but we, we really think that is the best um, 
that's the time to intervene um, to think about helping with things like imitation skills and social engagement skills um, so that uh, so that we hopefully um, can influence that trajectory of what happens with those skills but then also um, help with um, cutting down on deficits that might accrue because people are, are um, missing other skills that they would learn through social engagement and imitation. We think about um, wanting to be fairly intensive um, with our intervention. Um, so um, the research would suggest there's a kind of a breaking point around 25 hours a week. Um, and this is combining um, educational programming, um, private programming, things families are doing at home that's focused intervention, all of that combined. Um, the breaking points around 25 hours a week um, or more of intervention, um, those kids tend to have a better uh, prognosis. We think about a low student to teacher ratio or patient to provider ratio. Uh, we think about having a family component to the intervention. Most interventions that didn't have parent training as, as part of their intervention um, a few years ago now have it um, because we see how powerful it is to have to train parents in the in the uh, interventions that we're uh, presenting and using with their with their kids. Um, most interventions have opportunity for the individual to um, interact and practice with typically developing peers. Almost everything that's research-based measures progress um, and adjusts the intervention as needed. Um, these interventions tend to use pretty high structure, so things like routines and visual schedules. And they also tend to um, think about strategies that are gonna promote generalization. So um, things that are going to um, make this intervention work outside of the therapy room um, and that people are going to be able to maintain those um, those gains that they've made in therapy and um, perhaps even use them in new ways um, once they're out out of therapy okay so um there's um four websites that i like to send people to when they're looking to see kind of um, is an intervention effective or not? Um, and they're listed here on this slide. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, Council on Children's Disabilities is a good start. Um, the National Autism Center that put out um, what's called the National Standards Project. It's a little bit dated now, um, but um, has good information. The Association for Science and Autism Treatment. And then the one that I like the best and has been very recently updated is the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. Um, they just um, published an updated um, list of evidence-based interventions um, like maybe six weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and it's uh, very easy to um, consult as a list, kind of see what's on there, um, what makes the cut in terms of being evidence-based or not based on their criteria. The reason I put a variety of websites up on here is because all of them use slightly different criteria to determine if something's evidence-based or not. So some um, allow for more case studies and single subject design kinds of studies. Others are very um, into making sure that things are randomized control trials. Um, and so, um, Altogether, um, there's some consensus across these these websites that I'm going to talk about here on starting on the next slide. Um, but there is just differences in how they um, make the determination of like who makes the cut for saying yes, this is evidence based, or mm, this is a promising practice, or really no, this does not have research. Okay, so these are kind of the ones that there's consensus across all of these websites. Uh, Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA for short, um, has been around for, for quite some time now. Um, and uh, it includes really uh, a lot of different um, intervention te techniques within this, this group called ABA. So things like discrete trial training, functional communication training, prompting and reinforcement, they all kind of fall under this larger category of ABA. 
Of all the interventions out there for individuals with autism, ABA has the most research um, and uh, has very impressive results. And as you probably know, ABA has really grown in Iowa over the past 10, 15 years um, and um, is offered in more places than we've ever had it before. Um, but we still have shortages in areas of, of the state where there, there isn't enough or um, there isn't any ABA options that are close by. Uh, the next um, category is called naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. And these are interventions typically aimed at for younger kids that kind of blend ABA approaches with um, more naturalistic approaches. So things like floor time get blended with something like um, prompting and reinforcement. And um, there's quite a few different brand names for these interventions. The, the overall groups call this NDBI group. Um, but one that you may have heard of before um, that we have a, they have a little bit here in, in Iowa is called IMPACT. Um, another one that's pretty popular um, nationwide is called Early Start Denver Model. Um, and uh, as a group, um, they have uh, impressive results in terms, of, uh, in terms of the research studies where they've looked at kids enrolled in these programs over time or compared to kids who have this intervention versus those who do not. Next category is cognitive behavioral therapy and um, therapy aimed at self-management. So this would be for like individuals with autism who maybe are also having symptoms of um, anxiety or depression. Um, we know um, this kind of talk therapy can, can be very helpful. Next category is social skills training. And again, this includes quite a few different techniques, but peer-based strategies, social stories, scripting, social skills groups, all of those things have good evidence. Um, and um, as a category, they've worked really hard um, to, to um, improve their evidence base. And last is language training. So, you know, individuals working with a speech language pathologist um, to work on um, receptive and expressive communication skills that has good evidence. There's a few other strategies that are supported. So things like visual supports, visual schedules, naturalistic speaking strategies like modeling. Oh, modeling I have down below too. This kind of modeling is more though for um, modeling um, like social behavior, either live or through video, parent training, which I mentioned before. Then there's kind of a category of interventions that have some research um, and it's kind of a growing evidence base. Um, so we call these kind of promising or emerging treatments. The TEACH um, package, um, which uses a lot of visual structure and visual support, but as a whole package um, isn't, um, isn't at the top of the list for evidence base, uh, being an evidence-based intervention, but has some nice research behind it. Things like technology-based treatments, like using computers, or other electronic devices, music therapy, another category that has um, really come up, has done some very nice studies, not enough to make it to the top of the list yet, but they're coming on strong. And then um, things like uh, that are more naturalistic and developmental, like floor time, also have um, produced some, some nice research in recent years. And then treatments with uh, limited scientific evidence. Um, so uh, the gluten and casein-free diets, uh, facilitated communication and auditory integration training. Um, these are all interventions that do not have good research behind them. And things we would not recommend would be uh, chelation, um, which uh, is based on a theory that you would wanna move heavy, heavy metals um, from the body and then the other thing we would not recommend is very high doses of vitamins. Both of these things can be dangerous, so they are not recommended and there's no research to support their use. Okay, Todd, I think we're ready for you to talk again. All right, thanks Kelly. So yeah, the, gonna talk briefly about challenging behaviors and crisis management. So I had touched on this before, but Again, thinking about you know, your role as a case manager, um, a family may be approaching you because they have concerns not only that their child has autism, but about what we call those severe and challenging behaviors. So those are broadly behaviors that can cause 
harm to the individual themselves, to others, and to their environment, and that they're interfering with person's daily functioning, their ability to be successful at school or to go out in the community or at work. And these are just examples of those types of behaviors here. So physical aggression, self-injury, destruction of property, and what we call severe non-compliant behavior, meaning maybe not listening to parents or teachers or others. So why is there this strong relationship between autism and challenging behaviors? I mentioned earlier that probably upwards of 50% of individuals with autism at one time in their life at least do exhibit these kinds of behaviors. We think a lot of it does come back to the communication difficulties that are associated with autism. And that makes a lot of sense, I think, just intuitively, that if somebody cannot express themselves and or if they can't understand what others are expecting of them, that they may become quite frustrated and then use those challenging behaviors almost as a way to communicate what they do or don't want. So that communication deficits is definitely one of the primary reasons why we see challenging behaviors. A second is that pattern of restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. Sometimes when that's disrupted, if somebody can't line things up or talk about a particular topic, they may become frustrated as well. Why do we care about challenging behaviors? I know that sounds like a silly question, but it's important to point out that this is one of the main reasons that parents um, seek out help. Um, it's not because of autism per se some of the times, but it's because of these behaviors. And we know from a lot of research that having a child with challenging behaviors is strongly associated with parents reporting that they have stress themselves, a high level of stress, in the classroom, it's one of the highest reasons that teachers report stress is managing those behaviors. For the child herself or himself with autism and challenging behaviors, it puts them at very high risk of being physically restrained and unfortunately being physically abused. And it can lead to some bad outcomes. Um, less opportunity to participate in school, especially in a general education sit, uh, setting. Less opportunity to be successful at work. Less opportunities to live independently. Um, and we know that if these behaviors are not addressed when a child is young, that child often turns into an older child and then an adult with challenging behaviors. In other words, these behaviors don't often just go away on their own. So we can skip this. I kind of talked about what these behaviors look like, but those are just some examples. Along with those behaviors though, there are additional concerns that some parents may be speaking to you about. One of the big ones, is wandering or sometimes referred to as elopement. Um, and we know that individuals with autism are at high risk, unfortunately, of wandering off, which unfortunately can lead to some, some negative outcomes, including in some, some really unfortunate cases, death. Um, lack of awareness of danger signals. So many parents will report that their child just doesn't seem to understand. Um, traffic safety, for example, or other inherent risks in our environment. And then I had touched upon this, but very common to, to hear about significant sleep concerns, significant issues related to eating, toilet training is a big stressor, and then medical concerns can co-occur with autism. And I've just listed a couple of the more common ones. There are others as well. So what can we do to help um, a child or an individual with autism spectrum disorder and their parents. Um, because of a lack of time, I'm not gonna go into, into any real detail, but I do want you to know there are two main evidence-based types of, of interventions for challenging behaviors. The first one is medication management. There are some medications that have been shown to be effective, to be helpful um, for addressing physical aggression, irritability, and to a certain extent, self-injurious behavior. Um, and I often recommend um, if a child or individual with autism is engaging in severe behaviors to seek out a specialist. So that is oftentimes a child psychiatrist or an adult psychiatrist. And then the second main area of intervention that has a lot of research to support it is behavioral therapy or applied behavior analysis, as Kelly was talking about earlier. There is a lot of good research to demonstrate that when we change the environment around a person, 
We use strategies to support them, to improve their communication, to give them new skills, to reinforce those skills, and sometimes um, to put what we, the fancy term is putting a behavior on extinction, in other words, not reinforcing it, that that package of approaches can be very, very helpful. Sometimes we need both medication and behavior therapy to be maximally effective. Um, and you can see the note there, interventions like play therapy certainly have their, their place and can be extremely helpful, but for children with autism, with challenging behaviors, there's just not a lot of research to support those types of, of approaches or modalities. Okay, last I'm going to uh, briefly talk about some um, resources out there to um, support uh, individuals with autism spectrum disorders, their families, um, yourself as case managers. Um, so um, the Division of Child and Community Health uh, ha within the uh, um, UHC system has the Child Health Specialty Clinics, and these Child Health Specialty Clinics have the Regional Autism Assistance Program. And these, uh, re this Regional Autism Assistance Program helps um, kids aged uh, 0 to 21 um, with autism spectrum disorder and their families connect to early identification, um, treatment, intervention options, um, they help uh, with care coordination, and they help with family-to-family -family support um, of individuals in their community. And it's a program um, that is, um, is available to um, anyone in the state of Iowa that uh, has autism spectrum disorder or suspected autism spectrum disorder. Um, and you can read more about it on their website. And they have a referral form um, that you can complete if you have um, individuals that you think would benefit from this service. Um, and it's they're really, I think, a, a great service in that um, they individualize based on um, the family's needs and preferences. So if it's a family that um, wants to be contacted more frequently and needs a little bit more coordination um, and assistance with, um, with forms or with getting connected to local providers, that sort of thing, they can be there for them. Or if they just want more um, occasional updates on what's going on um, in their community, they can, they can sign up for that sort of rotation as well. One thing they do is, um, sorry, my slide is paused here. Let me see if I can get it going. They, um, know um, a lot about um, what's happening with ABA programs all over the state, um, which as I mentioned before, are definitely growing. Um, and uh, this is just the list with uh, the DHS maintains of, um, of ABA providers that accept autism uh, support program dollars. Um, but there's actually even more ABA providers than this that we um, kind of keep two lists, ones that, uh, uh, that are, um, that take this type of funding and then um, another list of, um, of ones that are out there, but they're not, that don't take that kind of funding. So, but they have both lists. They can see what's available um, in communities across, across the state. Another resource that I really like that they have is this caregiver guide for newly diagnosed families. Um, maybe you've seen the 100 day kit before from Autism Speaks. That's very nice as well but it's pretty big um, and it's not specific to Iowa. So their intention with this caregiver guide was to make something um, that was a, a little bit quicker to get through as a guide and that was more specific to what's available for families here in Iowa. That's available on their website. They can send it out to families over email um, and really is a good way for families to get started. Okay. So as you're thinking about your members, um, we really want um, you to encourage um, family members um, to form proactive uh, relationships with police and first responders for some of those um, reasons that Todd just mentioned with challenging behavior, um, especially with wandering. So you might want to think um, as you're doing that to check with local programs, local law enforcement programs to see if they have anything available um, to support members who wander. So things like the LOST program or E911, Home Again, Project Lifesaver, things like that have all 
um, developed here in recent years um, and are definitely growing across the state. We want you to encourage um, family members to seek out support from things like the Autism Society of Iowa, the Child Health Specialty Clinic's Regional Autism Assistance Program, ASK Resource Center is a nonprofit uh, that can help with uh, understanding um, what's available and uh, uh, with uh, special education uh, services and supports. <clears throat> if uh, appropriate and requested by the family, you can definitely assist with identifying residential programs and the waitlist process, pro, uh, process for pro, different programs. And of course, we want you to be familiar with the, the members um, Medicaid waiver coverage um, to identify appropriate services such as um, day hab programs or pre-vocational or voc rehab services, employment options, those sorts of things. Okay, if you have a family that's in crisis, um, what you do is probably gonna depend on the type of emergency, um, but it may be involving calling 911, contacting the local hospital, um, or um, contacting um, respite and SEL agencies to find out about if there's increased options or emergency options available for that family. And last here is websites uh, that we thought might be useful to you. Um, one is the one for the waivers from the DHS website. Um, and then of course, the one I talked about before with the, the caregiver guide, one that talks about the regional autism assistance program more generally, and then that, uh, that wrap form. And I believe the wrap form is also available as one of the handouts on the GoTeam meeting. Um, to meeting uh, handout section there today. Go to webinar, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I think we're wrapping up here right on time or nearly right on time. Um, if you um, have any feedback for us or um, any questions or things, um, you're welcome to send that information in and uh, we will try to get back to you. Thank you very much, Kelly and Todd. Yes, everyone, uh, please note under the handouts, if you didn't hear me in the beginning, there is a certificate of attendance there if you need that um, to go ahead and access it. And there is a rep brochure and referral form there as well. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Todd and Kelly. Thank you, Erica. Thank you.